clashes in Kosovo left dozens of people dead. Just this summer, Serbia was rocked by the largest protest movement since the toppling of Milosevic. And just this summer, Serb leader Dodic has once again threatened secession and, and, and criticised existing political structures as a failed experiment. The institutions and established mechanisms to avert a bloody return to the conflicts since the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia therefore require new innovative thinking and new mechanisms. Now, why does this matter? Policymakers now generally accept that they took their eye off the ball, and it's understandable why they did so. The situation in Ukraine, the rise of China, Taiwan, etc. But this deteriorating situation in the Western Balkans has profound implications for Washington and Brussels. Corruption, economic stagnation, and ethnic tension have already driven mass migration out of the Western Balkans, and a return to the endemic conflict of the 1990s would further stretch resources in Western Europe and galvanise far-right parties in those countries. And as the situation deteriorates, power, vacuum, power vacuums in the Western Balkans are also certain to be exploited by malign international actors. Today, we are very pleased to launch the Western Balkans Observatory to try to fill this gap. This observatory will hopefully provide rigorous, non-partisan analysis for Western policymakers on the Western Balkans. It will be a hub for policymakers, legislators, academics and journalists to discuss emerging challenges and the crisis in the region. We hope to have regular publications, events, roundtables based on a roster of 60 to 70 of top experts from the region and globally. And hopefully their unique insights will, will provide a basis for much better informed policy. Our senior non-resident fellow, Professor Tanya Domi, has been one of the key architects behind this initiative and the, and the principal driver. And I want to give my sincere thanks for Tanya, to Tanya for putting this all together, along with our chief coordinator, Calvin, uh, sitting here in the front row. And I'm going to leave it to Tanya to introduce our star-studded panel. We look forward to being a resource to everybody that's interested in the Balkans, that's interested in peace and security, that's interested in the implications that this would have for not just Europe, but the United States and the wider world. After this event, we'll be serving lunch, so please do stick around. We'd love to speak with you further. We'd love to learn more from you and make you part of this initiative. And with that, I'll pass it on to Professor Tanya Domi. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. And I wanna thank um, Dr. Ibrahim and the New Lines Institute for the vision and the recognition that this region is in a precarious situation. And we're jumping in from this institute here in Washington, but this I believe will be a game changer in terms of the dynamics on the ground that we have some of the best analysts on the Balkans working with us. And I think that this is a great opportunity at a very precarious time. So I thank you, sir. Um, our first guest is uh, Professor Dan Server. He's uh, with us online today. He's a professor at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, a senior fellow at the Science Foreign Policy Institute, uh, and as a minister counselor at the U.S. Department of State, Dan directed the European Office of Intelligence and Research and served as a U.S. Special Envoy and Coordinator for the Bosnian Federation, mediating between the Croats and Muslims and negotiating the first agreement reached at the Dayton Peace Talks. Dan is going to speak today about the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, uh, Serbia's influence in the region, and I'm also thrilled to announce that Dan has joined the Advisory Council to the Balkan Observatory at New Lines. Over to you, Dan. 
Dan, you're on mute, Professor. So I'm mute. Uh, you'd have to call him and <laughs> uh so, so i think you're gonna have to press the the mute button on your screen there we go you got it thank you there's the wrong button yeah Well, we can we yeah, can maybe just turn it over to one of okay. the panelists for a minute. Okay, the next speaker. Suddenly. Okay, so, just a minute. No, just a minute. I'm now going to uh, ask Ivana Stradner uh, to speak uh, to us today. Um, Ivana is a um, is a research fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies here in Washington. Uh, she is uh, also a special correspondent for the Kiev Post. Uh, Ivana uh, actually wrote an, uh, an article for us that's been published today about Russia's influence in the Balkans. And um, I would like to turn it over to you, Ivana. So thank you very much, first and foremost, New Alliance Institute for this immensely important initiative um, that will be focusing on the Balkans. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dami for inviting me um, um, to write for, for, for the latest report on Russia's influence in the Balkans. Um, and uh, I always like to say whenever you see the Western Balkans in the news, it's often not a good thing. And unfortunately, with the full scale of Russian invasion in 2022, um, the Balkans have, especially the Western Balkans, um, has been in the news almost weekly. And I wrote a chapter for, uh, for your monograph on Russia's influence in the Western Balkans. Uh, trying actually to shed more light on Russia's strategies and provide some ideas on how the West actually should respond. And while there has been so much ink spilled over this particular topic in the media recently, I always like to say this is really nothing new. People started paying attention to the Western Balkans and Russian influence, uh, mostly since February 22, but Russia has been investing tremendous resources um, um, uh, for the past decade in particular, if not even more. Uh, uh, Russia's playbook in the Balkans is very similar to the playbook that the Kremlin has been using in Moldova. And, uh, that, we, for example, what we see today actually with Nagorno-Karabakh and how Russia has also been uh, influencing a conflict over there, uh, 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 how Russia has been using social media platforms, how Russia has been exacerbating like tensions, ethnic tensions um, and religious tensions in the region. It's really just part of the Kremlin's uh, playbook. So the ultimate goal is really what does Russia want in, in the Western Balkans? I don't buy the argument that Russia want to occupy the country in the way that it would like, for example, to, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the way, for example, invaded Ukraine or the way that Russia has further imperialistic ambitions uh, in its own region. Instead, Putin perfectly understands that the Western Balkans is so vulnerable. Uh, and all it needs to do is to add more fuel to the fire so the Balkans really explodes. And the real question is why? Because to uh, take over the power from Europe and the West pretty more broadly, to organize chaos there, uh, especially now with uh, Russia's aggression in, in Ukraine, so the West does not pay that much attention to Ukraine, but the focus actually shifts 
in the Western Balkans. And I always like to say the only reason why the Balkans is still peaceful, it is because of Ukraine. Um, the more Ukraine wins, the Balkans will be uh, safer. But Russia has been investing tremendous resources, for example, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular, uh, with uh, uh, Milorad Dodik and his secessionist movements, uh, basically to show, uh, because Bosnia is tremendously sensitive and very polarized, especially nowadays, and by uh, uh, triggering more ethnic tensions over there and religious tensions over there with the stationist movement basically showed that the West is nothing more than a paper tiger. And we already saw just last week when Dodik also threatened um, uh, a foreign um, uh, envoy uh, who is uh, sitting in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina to arrest him that uh, one of the key problems with the West is they, they unfortunately still don't understand that weakness emboldens dictators and kindness is weakness. This certainly also is very much triggered from Belgrade, where uh, this would not be possible to orchestrate such a strategy without Belgrade's Serbia support that has lots of religious ties with Russia, also uh, energy dependent on Russia. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there is a huge disappointment in the West among a lot of Serbs. So I don't believe also that it's uh, uh, in Vucic's interest to, for example, align Serbia's foreign policy to uh, the Western poly foreign policy he hasn't imposed any sanctions on Russia. Uh, um, Serbia still serves as a great opportunity for a lot of businesses for Russia. So uh, that's the second part. The third part, you know, for example, is also the question of NATO. Let's not forget North Macedonia and Montenegro. Russia has been trying to exploit NATO to show that NATO is a paper tiger. I don't believe at this point that Russia can easily go to any of the Baltic states. Um, and to uh, invade Poland at this point. Uh, but I do believe that Russia has been trying to exploit weak links in NATO. And what a better way to do that than in the Balkans, especially in places such as Montenegro, that is tremendously right now vulnerable uh, uh, with intense influence through the Orthodox Church that completely polarized the country. Um, uh, and, uh, for example, what you just mentioned at the beginning of your talk, uh, with the latest escalations in Kosovo, that also serves two functions. One is for the Serbian president always to escalate and then to de-escalate and then to use that as a source of, um, a bargaining chip with the West but also for Putin actually to position himself as a mediator, telling the West, if you don't want to, for this conflict to spill over, you have to negotiate with me. So it's very, very convenient for, for both um, actors. And that's something that I'm particularly concerned about because Russia influence operations, I always like to say, it's like a stealth weapon. You cannot see it, you cannot smell it, you cannot touch it but it's tremendously powerful. And the playbook is absolutely very, very similar to influence operations, through social media platforms, cybersecurity attacks, something that Russia has been using in places, for example, such as, uh, uh, such as uh, Moldova. But the thing with the Balkans is the stakes are not as high as Poland, but high enough to make the West very, very uncomfortable. And just the very first fact that this summer, there were dozens of NATO peacekeeper being being injured through the far right groups. Um, that's really a dream come true uh, for uh, for Putin. And really, the ultimate question arises as to what should we do about this? Um, there are a couple of things to begin with. Here in the West, we have to also understand that this is a serious thing. That Russia is truly waging a hybrid war in the Western Balkans. Uh, Russia does not need to roll on tanks and jets in the region. All it really needs to do is continue with its powerful influence uh, operations in the region and just to destabilize it. Um, I think that's number one thing that we have to call a spade a spade. The second thing is, I still believe that the West uh, should, for example, send 
especially NATO, NATO hybrid warfare teams to help something they already did, like in places such as North Macedonia and Montenegro, to continue sending such teams in the region and experts who will actually help regional experts to gain even more knowledge and understanding of how things operate. The problem is also that there is no, for example, free media in, in Serbia, which uh, raises like additional questions to how can you even fight influence operations that are coming from both uh, uh, the government of Serbia, but also, you know, from Russia without having like a free media platforms, let alone RT and Sputnik that perfectly operate over there uh, uh, in, in, in the region because of the language everyone can actually understand, you know, in the region, like a similar message. So uh, raising the awareness and also building resilience is important. But not only that, I also do believe that we have to go also on the offensive. We are democracy here. We cannot fight Russia's information war with lies. But the truth is on our side. So a very great example that's actually happening right now with Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, uh, what a great opportunity actually to send a message to uh, the far right uh, nationalists in the region that Armenia already asked Russia for help and putting poor Armenia under the bus. What a great opportunity actually to show that Putin is losing its allies in just a matter of time when Serbia uh, will be uh, will be next. I think always humor and satire are always great ways really to uh, fight uh, Russian propaganda. So establishing um, maybe even, um, uh, for example, a grassroots movements, something that already exists similar like a NAFO movement, which Shiba Inu dogs that it's fighting Russian propaganda all over social media. Something like that would be also of, of, of great importance, but also to invest resources um, such as, uh, for example, to build more media platforms and online uh, social media platforms to provide a platform to young people in the region uh, to spread their own uh, messages because those the, the nationalism that exists right now in the Balkans is really only benefiting uh, the leaders. Unfortunately, the situation really, really reminds me a lot on the early 90s and how ethnic tensions started over there. I hope um, we will not see the repetition of uh, the 90s in the Western Balkans, but unfortunately, uh, it's really high time to call a spade a spade and to openly claim that we are in the information war uh, in the Western Balkans uh, with, uh, with Russia. And Russia is definitely not the only actor you have influence from other actors, including China, but that's outside and, and, and the influence is really huge. And that's probably for another, uh, uh, another conversation we'll have. So I will uh, pause here and I look forward to speaking with you after. Thank you, Ivana. So can we go back to Dan? Dan, are you hearing us okay? I think you, you have to turn off the mute. Oh, yeah, there you go. So I think we, we need to figure out a way to get the volume up on our end. Um, you grab the, the, the remote. Yes. Yeah, this is the TV. We're, we're dealing with a couple of technical things here. Right there. Yeah, I think that might be that's what, that's what sounds like. it sounds like really. yeah, there's, a, there's a few here. It looks exactly the same, but that is it. Here, can you put on the top? Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Oh, it's not the top. Okay. Choose output. Um, oh, the output for the. Yeah. Yeah. The speaker. The speaker should be back. Okay. Okay. Uh, Professor Server, I think we should be hearing you now. Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, Dan, let me just uh, stay again. Uh, 
Dan Server is a professor at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, a senior fellow at the Sykes Foreign Policy Institute, and as a minister counselor at the U.S. Department of State, Dan directed the European Office of Intelligence and Research and served as a U.S. Special Envoy and Coordinator for the Bosnian Federation, mediating between Croats and Muslims and negotiating the first agreement reached at the Dayton Peace Talks. Uh, I want to add that Dan's going to discuss the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue and the influence of Serbia throughout the region and wherever else he wants to go with this topic. Over to you, Dan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be able to participate in this launch of the New Lines Western Balkans Observatory. I'm a great admirer of New Lines, which has brought fresh thinking to Washington, especially but not only on Middle East issues. I hope to see the same devotion to new perspectives, deep analysis, and trenchant critiques from the Balkans version of New Lines. I, however, am an old Balkans hand. I fear I will not live up to my own expectations. What I see in the Balkans today is more of the same ethnic nationalist ambitions that haunted the region in the 1990s. The homicidal will and capacity have declined. But the effort to channel politics into uh, to enable autocrats to exploit the region's ethnic polarization is all too familiar. The most ambitious effort of this sort is headquartered in Belgrade. Backed by the Serbian Orthodox Church and Serbian security services allied with Russia, Alexander Vucic is aiming to make himself an elected autocrat and the godfather of Serbs throughout the region. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, he does this by seeking full control of Milorad Dodik, who tries to maintain his autonomy, but needs Serbia's financial and ideological backing. In Montenegro, he does it through the recently victorious and willing electoral proxies, not only President Milorovic, but also Prime Minister Spajic. Been asked to focus however, on Kosovo, where Belgrade has continued to control the Serbs of the four municipalities north of the Ibar River since the end of the war in 1999. Their cooperation and non-cooperation with Pristina are decided in Belgrade, not in North Mitrovica, Zuban Podak, Svechan, or Leposavic. The refusal to accept Kosovo license plates, the boycott of the last municipal elections, the rioting against non-Serb mayors, the attack on NATO soldiers, the kidnapping of Kosovo police in the north, the refusal to guarantee participation in new elections were all decided in Belgrade. What Belgrade is conveying, the signal they're trying to send, is that they will not allow the Serbs of the North to be governed within Kosovo's constitutional framework, unless they are given by the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities virtual autonomy that removes them from that framework in all but law. By the way, Pristina loses. It's clear why Russia would want this. The de facto partition of Kosovo offers a precedent that could be useful in Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine and undermines a Western achievement, the state-building project in Kosovo. It is less clear why the EU and US are backing this ethno-nationalist ambition for separate governance in Kosovo, which despite its many perfections, is the most successful democratic state-building enterprise in the Balkans since 1995, and perhaps worldwide. Of course, Brussels and Washington deny that they are that that's what they're doing. But have you heard it keep out of them about return of the Albanians and other non-Serbs to North Mitrovica, 
which was plurality but not majority served before 1999? Have they publicly urged Belgrade to offer the same accommodations to Albanians in southern Serbia that they want for Belgrade in northern Kosovo? The Americans write op-eds about guaranteeing that the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities will not be allowed to become a second Republic of Serbsky. But are they prepared to commit the U.S. government in writing to precisely what that means? They cite arrangements similar to the association that exist within the EU. But all those arrangements are between states that recognize each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity. So why shouldn't Serbia and the five non-recognizing EU states recognize Kosovo first before creation of the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities? The position of Brussels is, I fear, all too understandable. It's in the hands of a high representative who has never indicated any willingness to see Kosovo recognized or enter the UN. With the UK gone, he feels he has adequate backing from the member states. I expect better of Miroslav Lajka, who played a key role in the independence of Montenegro and promised when he first became Slovak foreign minister that Bratislava would recognize Kosovo. But he also failed to deliver. The position in Washington is more mysterious. It seems to derive in part from people who have spent too much time listening to Belgrade's moaning about how Americans are unkind to the Serbs, who just want a better deal for Serbs in the neighboring countries. It also reflects an ambition, a long-standing ambition, one I might even support in the long term, for a Europe whole and free with Serbia in the West. But with no evidence at all, American diplomats are claiming that Belgrade has embraced the West, even as it maintains and increases alignment with Mos Moscow and Beijing. I have little doubt that whatever Serbian ammunition ends up in Ukraine, more goes to Russia. And that Vucic's summertime visit to Zelensky aimed not to support Ukraine, but to prevent Kiev from recognizing Kosovo. So I'm afraid Kosovo is more isolated than ever. That's a problem. However you feel about Serbia's ethno-nationalist ambitions, and I oppose them vigorously, you have to worry that Prisha has lost too much traction with Brussels and Washington. It gets no credit even when putting forward that last week's dialogue with Belgrade, what I regard as a reasonably forthcoming agenda that was a step in the direction, a clear step in the direction of forming the association, albeit in accordance with Kosovo's own requirements. I confess I don't know how to solve that problem. I thought the August letter from the American and European legislators urging a rebalancing of EU and US policy toward more even-handedness between Belgrade and Prisha was correct. But so long as current personnel are in place, I expect the bias, counterproductive, and wrong policies to continue. The Biden administration needs a policy reevaluation and reset, but that would require courage and tenacity. The courage to tell the Secretary of State the current policy is not working and to develop a new, more even-handed and more effective approach. I'm not expecting that kind of courage and tenacity in the lead up to a national election, even if I might argue that it could garner more Bosnian and Albanian votes than it would lose in other departments. The best hope for the moment, I'm afraid, is Ukrainian victory, which would end Russian territorial ambitions, take the wind out of ethnic, ethno-nationalist sails worldwide, and give Bosnia, Montenegro, and Kosovo a leg up in contesting Serbia's regional ambitions. 
but I'm afraid Ukrainian victory is not imminent. I conclude, said we're going to have to continue to put up with a fruitless approach to the Belgrade Christian dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We'll come back to you. Uh, I hope with questions and comments. I'd now like to introduce uh, my colleague, Ralph Bayrovich, who is a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and vice president of the U.S.-Europe Alliance. He was a former minister of energy, mining, and industry of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Actually, Ralph, uh, contribution to our report today is on the limitations of Turkey's Western Balkans policy after Erdogan's re-election. And he will talk about this and we'll get into some other issues. Over to you, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you who are here and for watching us online. Uh, my special thanks go to Azim, who's done, a, in my view, a great service to the uh, Washington policy community by uh, creating this new initiative. And I think, as Dan said, new lines, uh, groundbreaking work from the Middle East, I think will be mirrored by what uh, will be published in the West Balkans Observatory Initiative. And uh, congratulate everybody on, on this new initiative. My uh, essay is, uh, is, is somewhat uh, frightening, I think, for a lot of those who, who read it. Because I, uh, bottom, my bottom line is that Turkey does not really have a lot of influence in the Balkans. Now, this is not something that people often say about Turkey in the Balkans. The uh, conventional wisdom is that Turkey is uh, here to Russians, Chinese, and other non Western actors in the region. I argue that it is not. And the reason for Turkey's uh, relatively uh, weak position in the region is uh, primarily in what happened in the Middle East after the Arab Spring, where as a result of the Arab Spring, Turkey-friendly governments came to power in Syria, uh, sorry, in uh, Libya, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, as, as those of you who follow the Middle East know, uh, President Erdogan's uh, alliances internationally oftentimes have uh, Islamist uh, elements. Muslim Brotherhood derived or friendly governments in Middle East were seen as uh, strengthening Turkey's hand in the region. The 20 13 decision by the Obama administration, this, the famous red line decision, in my view, uh, very long term effect on Turkey's influence in the Middle East, but had also a very, very uh, negative impact on Turkey's influence in the Balkans. Turkey's traditional posture in the region was to be a, you know, a proxy of essentially Washington. So, Turkey, or even during the war in the 90s, was more or less working in close cooperation, coordination, and at the behest of uh, State Department. And this changed after the, the split between Turkey and the Obama administration over Syria, over the red line uh, decision when the Obama administration decided not to enforce the red line it imposed uh, on Assad regarding use of chemical weapons. Uh, Turkey was deeply dissatisfied. If you fast forward to 2023, the uh, the government in Egypt is run by Sisi. The government in Syria is still Assad. Uh, Tunisia is no longer democratic and is not does not have a government that is friendly to Turkey. Turkey's only gain as a result of the uh, Arab Spring is the government in Tripoli, which doesn't control the entirety of Libya. Uh, Turkey's Traditional allies in the in the Balkans region are uh, the Muslim populations of uh, Kosovo, Albania, Bosnia and Montenegro. As you know, Islam came to the uh, Balkans as a result of uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire's inclusion of the Western Balkans uh, in the 14th, 15th century. And 
Muslim populations in the region have massively, this is something that is often not talked about, and I think deserves an event by itself, of the influence of the uh, migrations of white, uh, of European Muslim populations to Turkey in the 20th century, 19th and 20th century. There's more Bosniaks and Albanians, I, I'm certain of Bosniaks, Albanians, I, I don't, I'm not certain of, but there's certainly more Bosniaks in Turkey than there are in Bosnia. We're talking about millions of, of people, of Turks of uh, Bosnian origin, millions of Turks you know, of Albanian origin. And this is a dynamic, political dynamic. The existence of these voters is a political dynamic that is often overlooked in the West when talking about Turkey's uh, Western Balkans policies. There's a, a internal pressure on every Turkish government. And I lived in Turkey in the 90s during the war. It wasn't any different at that time. Of these populations that are most often uh, in, in big cities, Izmir uh, and Istanbul especially, um, to do something about uh, the Balkan Muslim populations. So uh, Turkey's uh, role in the region in, in today's, in, in 2023, in my view, is limited. Um, the main allies of Turkey, so the FDA party in Bosnia, uh, and uh, elements of, of political uh, the political parties in, in, in Kosovo and, and Montenegro have mostly been pushed out of government. So FDA, as a result of USCU uh, decision in uh, 2023, the imposed new constitution by the uh, German high envoy Christian Schmidt, was essentially uh, pushed out of government by the decree, by the international actors, which in my view is a, is a, is a huge blow to, to, to Turkey. It's an undemocratic move, absolutely uh, and I think unprecedented in history of democracy that you have an international envoy imposing a new constitution and a new election law the night of the election. And then six months later, imposing a new decision to push out the parties that uh, he doesn't like and the West doesn't like. The, the, the Biden administration, uh, in my view, as a result of this decision, has lost almost all of its sympathies and legitimacy among the Bosnian population in Bosnia. And I must say that somebody who supported Biden, I was you know, surprised, surprised and understated. Most of us, I think people who, who followed the region did not expect the policy that we see uh, in the last couple of years from the White House. So in, in this context of extremely uh, plain relations between Ankara, Washington, and Turkey is being pushed aside in the region, I think in almost every Every arena. Practicing Muslim, he is first and foremost a Kosovar and Albanian. And as a result of Biden's administration's attempt to appease Serbia, Kurti is now very close to, to President Erdogan and is, I think, considered. Uh, of, you know, the last serious uh, uh, ally of Turkey's that has the real power in the region. Turkey has tried, tried to, to work very closely with Serbia as well, with President Vucic, uh, but I think the decision by the Turkish government to uh, provide the Kosovar, Kosovars with the Bayraktar drones has uh, essentially limited the, the potential of Serbo-Turkish uh, relations in the near future. Turkey has chosen the, the side of the of the Kosovar government, and I think I think few people are really surprised about that. Ultimately, that this decision was made. Um, so, it should, should President Erdogan want to do something about Turkey's relatively weak position in the region? I think the logical starting point is to um, again try to work uh, through Washington, because U.S. position in the region right now. Is, and this is also something that people often, I mean, I wrote about it, but it's not something people, even in, uh, among analysts, talk about. There is a Russian uh, game in the region that is, you know, a long term uh, game that, that is very damaging to the region. But what we're seeing now in, in the last few months is that there, I think there's some sort of a tacit understanding reach between Washington, Moscow, and Brussels about the region. Uh, why do I think that? Well, because the uh, U.S. did everything in its power to push out parties that are close to, to considered to be close to Turkey, and has done everything in its power, Washington has done everything in its power to keep Dodik in government. 
Now, Dan has talked about the the inconsistencies in the policy and how people are people in in in, in the administration are un, simply unable to rationally explain what they're doing. I mean, why has the U.S. done everything in power to keep Dodi in government? Now, you know, they're talking about sanction. They sanctioned him, sanctioned people around him, and then did everything to keep him. You know, essentially give him the keys to the Bosnian government. People talk about, you know, I mean, people. I think Daniel said that. Uh, the uh, main parties in Montenegro are very pro Russia, pro Belgrade. Yet the U.S. is working with these parties. U.S. The, the, the special envoy, even uh, presidential special envoy for the region, has mostly been cooperating with these parties. So I think there's a, a, a tacit understanding about who does what in the region. And I think the goal in in the uh, eyes of the decision makers in Washington, the ultimate aim, is to keep the region from becoming Russia's second front. In, in, in Europe. I think the idea is to keep the region stable at all costs and keeping it stable in, uh, includes appeasing the strongest actors. The strongest actors are Croatia, member of NATO and EU member, which wanted a new election law in Bosnia, which the US supported via the high representative. Serbia, which has a number of offers, I, I often jokingly say on, on you know, in public debates and on, on television, that Serbian president, uh, Vucic is in his office, and he's uh, he's got several envelopes in front of him with offers from, from you know, one envelope says from Washington, the other one's from Moscow, the other one's from Brussels. There's an envelope from Beijing as well that we didn't talk about. And then you know he's looking at who's offering what, and he he hasn't still made up his mind. So you know this is the context in, in which uh, the Turkish influence, I, in my view, is really not. I don't want to say minor, but it has tough power abilities, you know, because of the uh, religious uh, sympathies of the popular parts of the population. But uh, the reality is that this is about the the big players in the region. I think the government in Budapest. I think Mr. Orban has more influence in the region because of the fact that Hungary is in the EU and key uh, positions within the EU that have to do with enlargement are occupied by Hungarian diplomats. I think they have more influence in, in this region than uh, the Turks do. So, and I'm going to conclude there. Uh, I think we're seeing a, a, a watershed, we're, we've witnessed a watershed moment in terms of Western policy in the region uh, this spring, when it became apparent that the U.S. is absolutely on the side of the government in Belgrade uh, in the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. Uh, EU is as well. I mean, yesterday it was more than apparent that the uh, both envoys, both uh, Mr. Lajčak, the envoy, special envoy, and the uh, Mr. Borel, who's uh, EU's uh, foreign policy person, are absolutely uh, openly criticizing the Kosovo government and are have sided with the now, I think, irreversibly with the government in Belgrade. And uh, we're we've seen that the uh, the even the pro NATO pro. West forces in Montenegro are exceptionally disappointed in, in what Biden administration has done in Montenegro. This is no longer about value. This is about keeping the region stable at all costs, which means appeasing those who have the ability to uh, push the region towards conflict, which is, again, Zagreb, Belgrade. And we're not going to go into Greece now. We're, we're focused on Western Balkans. But I think Greece, Greece, Zagreb, and Belgrade are key allies of the uh, by the administration in the region. And Turkey absolutely does not fit with any of those three at all. I'll, I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Ralph. I'm going to ask each of our panelists one question and then we'll open it up to the uh, audience. Um, Dan, I wanted to ask you, when the Biden administration came to power in, in 2000, um, this was an opportunity for a reset. 2020. I'm sorry, 2020, excuse me. Um, when when they came to power, this was an opportunity for a reset. And um, a letter went from Secretary Blinken to the Council of Ministers and VIH, and Ivana and I wrote about this in Foreign Policy. Uh, they came up with a pretty weak proposal. One was to address corruption, which is fine, and another one was about electoral reform. And we know what the outcome of that was, vis-a-vis -vis the Office of the High Rep last year uh, in October 22. So you said 
without a change in personnel, you fear that things will continue continue as is. How, in your view, is the administration really missed the mark here in the Balkans? What have they seem to have completely misjudged this period and what the challenges are in the threats? You're muted, Dan. I don't think we've had uh, more experienced people uh, in about the Balkans in Balkans related positions ever in the past. So it's not their lack of experience uh, that is an issue here. What's an issue, it seems to me, is their uh, uh, incorrect vision and their lack of means. They frankly don't have any way of getting uh, the kind of leverage that the United States had in the Balkans in the past. And they know that. And so they settle for uh, minimal policies that, as Ralph has said, uh, appease the local powers. I just don't think uh, today that the Secretary of State thinks for more than one minute a month about the Balkans. He gave a talk at uh, Johns Hopkins SICE the other day and never mentioned the Balkans, if I, if I heard him correctly. Uh, he mentioned many, many other issues, never the Balkans. The fact of the matter is that the Balkans have fallen off the priority table in Washington. And the people in charge know that that's the case and therefore are limiting themselves to what they think are low, uh, uh, low resource uh, policies. Uh, and those policies basically uh, assigned to the to Belgrade and to Zagreb, and to some extent also to Tirana, uh, responsibility for most of what goes on. They delegate to the high representative in in Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though he has demonstrated unequivocally his incompetence. Uh, why do they do those things? Because they don't have access. They don't have uh, the kind of leverage that is required to do something uh, more substantial. Uh, and then, let me just follow up too. Germany, when the new German government came to power, that was another opportunity for a reset. And obviously the Americans want to remain close with Germany, but again, that opportunity was was declined. They did not act, even though they have their man in Sarajevo in the office of the high rep. Well, can you can you talk about just what your ideas are about the German government? Why why their relationship with the United States on the Balkans hasn't been more uh, you know, more joined and more uh, more. Uh, consistency as an approach to the region? I think I have to probably uh, uh, dispute your premise. Uh, I do think that the high representative in his decision on, on uh, the Bosnian election uh, was motivated uh, principally, I'm afraid, by the Americans. Uh, I don't I disagree. That, I don't disagree. So I think that was the case where the Americans and Germans were really uh, tightly bound to each other. At least, if you regard Schmidt as a, a, as reflecting German policy. What I worry about more than anything else with respect to German policy is that it seems to have departed from the traditional support 
for a liberal democracy in the Balkans as much as American policy has parted from that traditional support for a liberal democracy, for individual rights. The clear need today in the Balkans is to move the political systems away from group rights and towards individual rights. And neither Germany nor the United States, the, 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 the traditional champions of liberal democracy, are uh, pushing in that direction. And with the UK having fallen out of the EU, uh, that factor is, is, is reduced as well. And the Balkans are doing what they do naturally. They're moving in autocratic, ethno-nationalist directions. Thank you. Um, Ivana, uh, in your essay, uh, you wrote that Vucic's ultimate goal is to remain in power for as long as possible. And we have seen him persist and uh, basically he runs his puppets and has them, his surrogates, do what they may, and he cooperates very carefully with these people. What do you think his broader uh, broader goal is beyond remaining in power? What is in his interest, in Serbia's interest, uh, in terms of destabilizing the region? So... There is no broader objective without really understanding his ultimate goal, which is to remain in power for as long as possible. He wants to be a new Yossi Broz Tito, uh, someone who can position himself as a source of stability in the region. And this is precisely what I like to argue that while Russian influence is tremendously powerful in the region, that would not be possible without Serbia's support and giving a platform to Russia because Vucic is not the victim of Russian influence. He's enabling Russian influence because he needs to appease both Beijing, Moscow, Brussels, and Washington. And then how do conflicts actually uh, fit in that agenda? Well, it's not just like over the summer in Kosovo. He will continue to escalate the crisis to the brink of war, and then to de-escalate the crisis, and then to use that as a bargaining chip against the West with the negotiations in the West. Uh, what you understand perfectly what resonates with the Americans. In the United States, it's all about get things done, let's have a deal, and that's it. And what better way to offer economic cooperation America is all about economic cooperation, and he understands that perfectly by filling all those ideas like let's make an open Balkan initiative, uh, let's have a more investments, and Americans love it because they can always report that um, and to claim a victory. But when in fact, the situation in the region was, uh, uh, Professor Server just emphasized this ethno-nationalism is tremendously more important uh, for the region, uh, uh, for all those leaders than, uh, than economic uh, uh, progress. I always like to, to say that, unfortunately, in the Balkans, nationalism is much tastier than uh, any, uh, any new foreign uh, investment. So really, like, the ultimate goal, you know, for which it is definitely, you know, remain in power, and when it comes to, you know, all those broader agenda, not only in Kosovo, but we see, for example, in Montenegro, which it fears um, democratization of the region. Just like Putin fears democratization of his neighborhood, so the same thing which it has been implementing his policy. And my last point that I want to emphasize here, what I also see as um, as a, uh, as an analogy, uh, when Vucic came to power, the first thing he did he destroyed true liberal opposition. That was the number one goal, because without having truly liberal, pro democratic, pro Western opposition, and then by 
fueling and, and beating the far right groups and nationalists, he always looks like a uh, in the center for the West. And think about it is that's a very similar strategy with Putin did in his early stages of his political power. He destroyed liberal opposition. He strengthened far right groups, and then he basically claimed, I mean, to the West, you have no option but to work with me. I'm the best option among all those uh, horrible options that, that you have. And unfortunately, the West is falling into that trap. And I promise this is my last point. Uh, <laughs> okay. But I think this is tremendously important. Washington loves quick fixes. It's all about instant fixes. And the ugly truth is, Balkans is very complex and very, very difficult to manage and to solve all those issues. It's like a putting just a Band-Aid on a, on a wound. Uh, and sometimes it's better not to open like a Pandora box, which is right now happening. Uh, and this is where I also agree with, with Rav, with what he basically, you know, claimed that uh, stabilizing the region at all costs is the only thing that Washington has in mind. But one thing is what Washington wants. Another thing is, I'm afraid, what uh, the Kremlin and Beijing want. So we shall see how this is going to fold. Well, I'll just say that when you talk about money and investment, you're not addressing the core political issues. So it's all for a show, as far as I'm Absolutely. concerned. All for a show. All and, for a show. Yeah. And Ralph, I'd like to ask you, because you have talked about this, um, about the role of the Croats, and you have actually said that in the region, the Croats have been perhaps even more uh, pernicious and corrosive than the Serbs themselves. You have an EU government in Zagreb, and you have many surrogates for Russia uh, in Croatia and also in Bosnia, that drag on Chova, just an example. Can you uh, talk about that? And this is an essay that actually Yasmin Mujanovic wrote for the launch. Um, I do want to tell our online audience that all the essays are available on the New Lines website. Uh, it's live and you can go to it. Uh, and we will be providing uh, separate URLs for the individual uh, essays later, but I encourage the audience to go and inf inform yourself. And also N1 in Sarajevo is, has published uh, Kurt Bassinger's uh, essay today, and they will be rolling out these essays uh, throughout the coming days. So uh, if you could talk yeah. about this, Ralph, because I think it's a big issue. It doesn't get enough attention. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, big question. Big uh, there is no daylight between Zagreb and Moscow uh, and Belgrade and Washington and Brussels on what uh, Christian Schmidt did the night of the election. This is the only decision by the high representative which did not provoke a response from the Russian embassy in Syria. So people often say, well, you know, there's this um, conflict between the world. Western powers and, and Russia over. We have not seen that in the last, well, 18 to 12 months in, in the region, especially in Bosnia. Uh, Croatia's main partner in Bosnia is, they, they work with Zagreb, they were sorry, with Washington, with Brussels. Brussels is Zagreb. I mean, they, they've used their leverage within the EU very aggressively to for this issue of you know election law uh, that Schmidt imposed, and they work very closely with Moscow. You know the the the, the main proxy, Zagreb's main proxy, the HDZ party in Bosnia, is exceptionally close to the Russian embassy, Russian interests. The Russians have openly supported their positions. So it, we're in a unique position where uh, Zagreb. Belgrade not so much, which was not so interested in what Schmidt did. He would he kept sort of he kept to himself, right? But Zagreb, um, together with Washington, Brussels, and Moscow, imposed the new election law in Bosnia. Now this uh, I know it comes as a surprise to many, but there is so much cognitive dissonance right now in terms of what the Western diplomats and politicians say about the region and what they do. 
it is, you know, and I think we're in a position where uh, there's this contradiction is so wide open. It is so uh, apparent to everybody that follows the region. And then I think called it a mystery. I think he said that there is no real explanation. Officially, no U.S. or uh, European official has acknowledged the, the, the reasoning behind the, the policy right now. We don't really know why the West is doing what it's doing, because West doesn't want to accept that it's doing what it's doing. So we're, we're really in, in almost, a, a, I mean, I, I followed the Middle East for, for uh, quite some time, worked on the Middle East for, for years in Washington. I mean, we're, we're almost where Obama administration was in Syria in 2013, for those of you who follow. You had one thing being sent from the podium and a whole different thing being done on, on, on the ground. And in my view, I mean, I, I was, I was old enough to, to remember the 1990s and what happened in the 1990s. But I, don't, you know, I think the media, and what, what, uh, what the Western media did to, to the Clinton administration uh, allowed everybody to see what was really going on, allowed for the truth to come out. But nobody's being killed now. There, there isn't real, uh, you know, there are no problems. The Balkans, is, is, as you say, in the news, but it's not, there, blood is not flowing, right? So as long as, as there's no, nobody being killed, People don't really care, right? And the weak side, weaker sides in the region, so Pristina, Sarajevo, and uh, Podgorica, do not have enough of a voice in the international media to really uh, shine a bright light on this discrepancy between what's being said and what's being done, this contradiction. So uh, I think that what what the, this this report did is 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 the is the step in, in this in the right direction, right? And uh, Yasmin wrote about the Hungarians as well. I think yes, we, we often yes, underestimate what Hungary uh, does in the region. In my view, Hungary is by far the most influential uh, EU capital besides Zagreb in the region. And I, I'll, I'll end here, and I'll disagree a little bit with, with some of my predecessors. People talk about, I think somebody said, you know, Western support to Vucic. I don't think West supports Vucic. I don't think this is about him personally. I mean, we're talking about an exceptionally skilled leader very adapted, as you said, what Washington wants, quick fixes, uh, you know, deliverables and so on. This is about Western attempt to pry Serbia away from Russia. And this has been going on since at least Jinjic. I remember I was doing more or less the same thing in uh, when Tadic was in power in Serbia for almost eight years. I don't think he was any different. The players were more or less the same. I mean, we have the same diplomat. The, uh, I remember Matt Palmer was in Belgrade, uh, uh, US, uh, the U.S. Embassy, he was number two when Tadic was there, and it, there was a lot of support for Tadic and Serbia's position, even at that time. Uh, he's now, in, I think he's in, uh, he's in London. He's in London. But anyhow, he was, he was around for about 10 years, right, at, at State. And I, I think the policy is essentially uh, the same, but the Russian, uh, Russian second aggression, is that the right way to Full aggression against Ukraine has completely changed the incentives for even the, the diplomats running the show, the Western diplomats running the show in the region. So now you 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 know you don't have the luxury to really quote it all in in diplo speak. You know, ugly things must be done, so they're doing them. Uh, and it, it simply uh, increased, heightened the contradictions, as the. Uh, as, as what, what, what was being <laughs> during communism, they said you got to heighten the contradictions to, to make the other um, weaker. So this has heightened the internal contradictions within the policy. On one side, people talk about human rights and democracy as a, something that the West stands for, uh, while in, in reality you see the West is absolutely against human rights and democracy in the region because it's the expedient thing to, thing to do and it keeps the region stable. I would just add, thank you so much. I would just add, and I've had conversations with Kurt Bassinger about this, is that, you know, the American approach in Ukraine, democracy, rule of law, stop the aggression, uh, the values that the American State Department espouses is one thing, as you've pointed out, but on the ground in Bosnia, they are not saying what they say to you. I mean, they no, are saying. The, can I just add this? Yeah, privately, please. privately, people at yeah. the State Department of the White House, they'll say, well, we know that there is a contradiction, that there is right. this right. Uh, discrepancy, but we got to do it to save Ukraine. Like, we simply ha we have to leave the Balkans, 
put it aside for a few years until we fix Ukraine. So in a way, Balkans is victimized by, is, is a collateral damage to, to what Putin Absolutely. did. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that also reflects on the State Department, their lack of understanding of the centrifugal forces that is operating in Ukraine and how it is disproportionately affecting the Balkans. You have comments? Yeah, I would just like to comment on one sure, thing, please. Uh, which is, for example, there is now a new push coming from the European Union to integrate all countries from the Western Balkans in the European Union, along with Moldova and Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But the ultimate question is, does really President Vucic want Serbia to be in the European Union? If you listen carefully to his speeches, he rarely talks about EU membership. He talks about the European Union path. And why is that? Because throughout the process of integration, Serbia is receiving lots of money. And he needs that for his political survival. He would absolutely not benefit from uh, uh, living and bringing Serbia to the system because that would undermine his authoritarian uh, um, um, uh, government. But Orban loves it. Absolutely. And that's you know, Orban loves it. But you know what's interesting? Yes, he does love it because he created a one party state that was enabled by Angela Merkel, who negotiated with it. But Russia so, actually needs Serbia and the European Union as another true and force, just like a Hungary. And that's why, in part, it is also why Hungary is now pushing for the Western Balkans integration in the European Union. So I will stop okay, here. So we're gonna, now what we're gonna do, the interesting comments, really, really appreciate the panelists. I wanna open it up to the floor and I wanna tell our audience, please go to the New Alliance Institute website so that you can uh, obtain the monograph and, and you'll able to read it. Uh, we're delighted to share it with the public. So please raise your hand and if you have a question and identify yourself. No questions? Anybody? Yes, right here, sir. Um, um, my name is Don Petroport. I'm a student at Zeiss. Um, so I guess this is a question for the panel, but a lot has been talked about uh, like traps or the way that people in the Balkans are behaving, but I don't like, I want to get your responses to how a lot of these things were actually set by the West. I mean, for Croatia, we talk about they uh, were basically rewarded for ethnically cleansing their country, um, kicking out all the minorities. Then they got Schengen after they forced migrants from the border back into Bosnia. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, what happened with the Dayton Peace Accords, that was uh, like, again, the conditions are set that the politicians now are operating in, and it was set by the Western countries. So when we talk about how do we move forward and stuff, when the West is rewarding these behaviors and have set these rules before. And now it's like, why are you behaving by these rules that we set? So what is the solution? <laughs> Dan, do you want to take that question? Well, I think I've indicated where I think the solution lies. I think it lies in application of our own principles of liberal democracy insofar as possible in the Balkans, but let me give you an example or two. Uh, you know, the Dayton Accords created this elaborate constitutional structure with two entities and 10 cantons and then municipalities. Well, it's, it's fairly easy to imagine the elimination of the, uh, of the entities and the cantons as governing structures and having the Batsi and Herzegovina that's governed uh, at the local level by, uh, by the municipalities and at the national level by uh, a government with the powers needed to negotiate and implement the acquis communautaire of the European Union. And that proposal has been sitting out there for a long time. What it lacks is support inside Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I'd be the first to admit that. But if you think about it, it would provide rather ample space for uh, for those who 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 want to be different only by their own kind. Let me put it that way. But the ethnic nationalists uh, would, you know, there would be Croat 
municipalities, which are mainly governed by Croats, and then the Serb municipalities, mainly governed by Serbs, and then the Bosniak uh, municipalities, mainly governed by Bosniaks. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, so long as the rights of the minorities are protected. And there, the key is the judicial system, and it's sorely lacking in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, that model of national governance and strong municipalities is what it actually exists in Kosovo. Uh, and, you know, what, one of the problems with this association of certain majority municipalities is that it's hard to tell what additional powers they want for it beyond what the Serb municipalities, the Serb majority municipalities already have, because they have very ample, ample powers. Uh, so it seems to me that the idea of municipalization, which was also applied in uh, Macedonia and which exists also in, in Montenegro, that that's a good direction for the Balkans as a whole, and one that while not uh, eliminating uh, ethnic nationalism, provides a better political framework in which, uh, in which individual rights can be protected and group rights exercised uh, where, the, where, where a particular group is a majority. So that to me is the obvious direction for, for the uh, constitutional frameworks throughout the Balkans. It, including, frankly, in Serbia, where the municipalities uh, could use more authority than they have today. Thank you. Yeah, David. Yes. First of all, excellent question. I mean, truly excellent question. Uh, look, I think Germany never wanted a country that are majority Muslim to join the EU. I think that was the plan from the beginning. That's a, something you often don't hear, but We've come now to a point where 20 years after the Thessaloniki summit, where everybody was promised EU membership, Croatia is in the EU, Slovenia is in the EU, they're both Catholic majority countries. Who is at the tail end of EU integration process? Turkey, Kosovo, Albania, Bosnia, Bosnia, Albania. What do those four countries have in common? They're the only Muslim majority countries in Europe. Uh, Croatia, as you say, was you know, there was, you know, they turned a blind eye to, to what happened during the war. A lot of people say that it was justice that Croatia, legally speaking, Croatia was absolutely in the right, the same way that Azerbaijan is legally now in the right in terms of the nagorno karabakh issue, right? Legally, they are, it's their territory. But the Serbian, uh, greater Serbia idea was rewarded with the piece of Bosnia that's called the RS, which, which was ethnically cleansed of the non serb population. Uh, Bosniaks got the, you know, you, Bosnia to remain a state, but after the decision of the, uh, of Schmidt's decision in, in 2022 and 2023, uh, Muslim, Bosnia is a Muslim majority country where you have a minority rule. Basically, Bosnia Muslim population does not really have an influence over decision making in Bosnia today. I mean, that's a new, it's never been like this, that's a new element. And you have a Belgrade government, which I think, as you say, uh, really knows that the EU does not want Serbia in the EU. I think ultimately Germany and people of other capitals do not want Serbia in the EU. Montenegro maybe has a shot at EU membership, but others I think do not. I think Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Serbia do not have a real shot at EU integration. And that's where the region is at right now. And nobody wants to say that. I mean, publicly, it's a, I mean, Vucic has said it, Rama has said it, uh, Open Balkan uh, idea, Open Balkan Initiative came uh, uh, as a result of, of the awareness of some, that, you know, there is no such a thing as EU integration. While people in Brussels want to keep the illusion of EU integration alive, because through this illusion is, is how they will power, right? But if you look at last 10, 12 years, I mean, it's been over 10 years since Montenegro opened EU accession talks. Turkey has been negotiating I mean, there are people who've lived a full life since Turkey started negotiating. It's been, you know, 50, 60 years, right? So this region right now is in a vacuum in terms of 
where is, you know people had this feeling of we're all going to EU. There was this regat approach, right? As Croatia was and Slovenia ahead, and everybody else was coming in line. Well, guess what? They closed. They closed the wall the moment the Croatia entered. And this is something that should be talked about. People don't want to talk about it. They want because they, you know, democratic democratic standards that these countries don't. Mean. I mean, what democratic standards does Hungary mean? Yeah. Well, Mr. Macron really put a kibosh on this in 2018 uh, on EU enlargement, and I think cast a pall over the region and really depressed hopes. I think it was a terrible blow to the region when he said, we're going to change the rules in the middle of the game. Yeah, the, the rules have been changed. Yeah. So the rules under yeah. which Croatia and Slovenia entered no longer apply. And that's, you know, I think we should we should face those facts and move from there. And as you said, some were rewarded, some were punished. I'm Another sorry. question? No, we're going to go to me. Yes, to you. Yes. It's Mild Chase, President of the United Strategic Alliance for Bosnia and Herzegovina, or USABIH. A question for Ivan Andreu. Um, to what extent could coordinated strategy between Sarajevo and Podgorica uh, potentially um, counter these horrible solutions coming from the from the Western countries. Do you think it's possible at all, knowing that Bosnia doesn't formally recognize Kosovo, uh, and also knowing that Kosovo basically didn't say much about the latest uh, Schmidt's impositions in 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 Bosnia? Uh, I think it's better, Ralph. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's a that's a great strategy on paper, but in reality, uh, it will not work. First of all, there is no Sarajevo anymore. The government in Sarajevo is now controlled. It's a condominium. It's a Serbo-Croat condominium. The present government in Sarajevo. This is the first time it's happened. Probably so. So the only time the Bosnia was in this position that we know of, that wasn't really governed by Sarajevo. By Sarajevo based elites that had political power within even larger systems was during the Tetkovic much agreement in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, what was was split between Zagreb and Belgrade, really. Uh, and during during the war, when parts of the country were occupied, then Sarajevo could not uh, project power on, 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 in, in that part of the territory. So there is no Sarajevo. There is no Podgorica because the government Podgorica is really controlled by regional powers. And you only have a Pristina, right? And even when there was a Podgorica, and when there was a Sarajevo, it was the government that, you know, by those, uh, by the population, the government that had the legitimacy of the majority of the population that it identifies with the state. Let me just put it that way. Zagreb did a lot to keep uh, Kosovo away from Sarajevo. You'll see often Grlic Radman going to, to, to Pristina, trying to keep the Kosovars from, from cooperating with, with Sarajevo. Same thing happened in Podgorica. When there was a ruling coalition, even DPS sort of stayed away from, did not want to. Uh, uh, so these, uh, they, they, there isn't enough understanding. I think Sarajevo was willing to cooperate very much. But uh, Croatia's uh, diplomatic efforts really quite successfully managed to keep Podgorica and Pristina away from cooperating with Sarajevo. Same with Iran, because Edi Rama is, is, a, is an exceptionally skilled politician. And you saw him trying to, to, you know, trying to use the Open Balkan Initiative to, to put pressure on Brussels to let, uh, the, let the countries join join the EU, uh, come closer to the EU. That was the whole point from his perspective. Belgrade's perspective is, is different, but even Rama did not want to go into this because he needed parts of the EU on his side. He, you know, Washington loves him. He likes Washington. It's, it's all great for him. And this is something that people in Washington knew. And when people say they don't know, as Dan said, well, the most important thing said today is that this is the most informed, the most skilled administration in history of, of, you know, of the region. They know exactly what they're doing, right? So to counter this, I think it's much more likely to come from the U.S. Congress, the way it came in the 90s, than it is from, from these capitals. Because the foreign minister of Bosnia is directly controlled by Dagger. I mean, he is he's somebody who is very close to Dagger. Uh, he, uh, Dodik is the government. Why? Because Washington asked for Dodik to be in government. The government without Dodik, without EZZ, and without NPA, so main ethnic parties could have been formed after these elections. Western capitals, especially Washington, said, no, we want Dodik in government, we want Zagreb name proxy in government, but we want SDA, which is considered close to Turkey, out of government. And they, as you know, they installed a government that really doesn't have 
political. I mean, it doesn't have legitimacy, right? It was, it was an imposed government. Uh, same thing happened in, in Montenegro. I mean, you, you have now a technical government, they might go, they might go and have a new election, right? So, Pristina is the last bastion of, uh, of sort of resistance to this uh, uh, new policy, which I think is, we'll, we'll find this out probably in 10, 15 years when memoirs are written. I think in, in their mind, they're trying to deny Russians the second front. And that's why they're doing, you know, at all costs. Well, this actually is the end of our program. I want to thank each of our panelists and I want to thank the online audience for being with us today and keep following us because there's more to come. And Azim, would you like to make some final comments? Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Tanya. Thanks so much to the speakers and thanks so much for everybody for attending. Uh, as Tanya mentioned, you know, the Balkans Observatory, the Western Balkans Observatory, it's a very comprehensive project. This is just the first phase. There's going to be multiple phases in which we actually um, uh, uh, escalate and uh, expand on this project. There's lots of different parts, moving parts to it. Um, uh, so this is just the earliest stage, just to kind of socialise the idea. But do keep following us and you'll see that, um, uh, you know, we've got quite ambitious plans to ensure that uh, we bring the best analysis from the best people uh, to the key decision makers in Washington and Brussels. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks to the speakers and thanks for Calvin uh, for putting us all together.